Well, if you haven't already, uh, go ahead and open in your copy of God's Word to the uh, prophecy of Joel. If you're coming from Hosea, take a right. If you're coming from Amos, take a left. You're going to find it. You can't miss it. Uh, we're going to look at the first four verses of the prophecy of Joel. Let me uh, go ahead and uh, pray first, and then we'll uh, take a look at these verses. Let's pray. And our great God, we do give you thanks that you have uh, given to us these words, that we can uh, marinate on them, that we can be uh, encouraged, convicted, uh, comforted by them. We pray that uh, you would speak now and that we, your servants, uh, would have ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, here are the first uh, four verses of the prophecy of Joel. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days, or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children, and their children to another generation. What the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And with the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. These are the first uh, four verses of the prophecy of Joel. They are the introductory uh, verses that uh, really set the stage uh, for us. One of the reasons that uh, we decided to look at this prophecy of Joel is because things have been developing so rapidly over the last couple of weeks that I don't know about you, but I've been feeling like a turtle by the side of the highway trying to figure out when is going to be the right time for me to cross the road. It's a high stakes game of a frogger, it seems like. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, coming from someone who really loves to plan, this has been rather difficult and it's prompted a number of times for me uh, this question What do we do now? What do we do now? So as Pastor Donnie and I have been talking about, what do we do now uh, and, and how we can use this, uh, this time uh, for good, uh, we decided to go through the book of Joel. And so in these opening verses of Joel's prophecy, the question really is, is offered to us, what do we do now, with three answers given to us. We're going to look at these verses in, in three parts. We're going to look first at verse one, we remember. Verses two and three, we reflect. In verse four, we, we refuse. That'll be our, our, our structure for uh, this time. First of all, we remember in verse one that God speaks in times like these. God speaks in times like these. Look at verse one with me here. This is the superscript. It's the title of this prophecy. And it actually yields very little information, so you may be wondering why we're going to spend any time on it. We'll get there, but let's just lay out the facts here. We know that, uh, that the name of the prophet is Joel, and we know his daddy's name. It's Pethuel. But there are no other historical markers to place Joel in Israel's history for us, either here or externally uh, around this book. So what that probably means is that this brief introduction of the prophet uh, was given because he would have been well known at the time and no other identifying information would have been necessary. It would be like if you refer to Madonna or Adele right now. Everyone knows who you're talking about, but uh, decades or centuries from now, the context might be lost and no one will have any idea what you're talking about. You see, the lack of precision in, in identifying Joel as the prophet is consistent with the lack of precision in identifying the context of this whole book. We have no external evidence that can pin this prophecy to a specific period of time. And the internal evidence is the same. It's frustratingly vague. The fact is that this prophecy is a general nature. And that lends itself to being applied in a number of situations. Because of that, I'm not even going to offer you a time of dating. Now, if you go search our sermon uh, audio, you'll see that uh, Pastor Donnie has. But uh, I'm not even going to do it. Because whether or not Joel intended this prophecy to be broadly applied in the life of church, God of, of the church, God certainly did. This Old Testament prophecy is a valuable resource for believers of every age, because it helps us remember that God speaks in times like these. 
Look at verse 1. We, we skipped over this, but this is the word of the Lord. It's not Joel's word of encouragement or pious advice. It's God's word. And we shouldn't quickly skim over this statement, even though it is a common introduction to prophetic words. You see, in times like these, it ought to be a great comfort to us that the word of the Lord came to a prophet that we might remember that God speaks in hard times. So God speaks when things are bad. We know that his word is trustworthy and true, and therefore now is a great time for us to engage with God's word if we've been distant from it or absent from it. The God who made heaven and earth, he's not a fair-weather God. He's not one who only stoops down to encourage his people when things are going well, but abandons them when things are hard. No, he speaks in times like these. We need to listen to him. So let your quarantine be an opportunity to hear from God more than you normally would. Memorize some scripture verses. Commit to reading the Psalms. Find some way to be more engaged with God's word because he speaks in times like these. You might have comfort in the chaos. But what does he say? God speaks, but what does he say? Well, the opening verses after the superscript that give us uh, the opening words of God to us in times of chaos. And this is the second answer to our question, what do we do now? We reflect on the lessons learned from times like these. We reflect on the lessons learned from times like these. Look at verse 2 here. This opens up with two imperatives, hear and give ear. And these commands are a call to pay attention. It's as though Joel is saying, if you're not taking notes, now is the time for you to pull out your pen and your paper and pay attention. But then in, verse, in the second half of verse 2, he doesn't drop some knowledge on them. He actually calls them instead to reflect, to turn inward. He says, has such a thing happened in your days and the days of your fathers? This is a call to pay attention and reflect on what's happening because it is unprecedented. They're to search their own, their own personal history and the national history to think about, has this happened to us before? It's a call to stand at arm's length and to think about what's going on around you. But more than that, our, our reflection should include a generational aspect. We see that in verse 3. Joel calls for parents to recount what it has and is happening to their children. And then those children must keep the memory alive by teaching it to their children and, and those children, all, oh, so on to the fourth generation. One commentator has put it this way, Joel's purpose is to drive them to perceive some meaning in this low point of a unique disaster and to relate it to themselves to the providential purposes of God. Let me say that one more time. Joel's purpose is to drive them to perceive some meaning in this low point of unique disaster and to relate it and themselves to the providential purposes of God. Let me make one more point about this, uh, these opening verses about reflecting on lessons learned. This is a corporate action. It spans the breadth and the depth of community. All three of these imperatives, imperatives, you have to know, are plural. And the addressees, if you look at verse 2, the beginning, it's the elders and the inhabitants of the land. That comprises the breadth of the community at, the, at a given time. It's everybody. Everybody is called to reflect on what's going on. And then in verse 3, that command to recount these things to the fourth generation means that there is a generational depth to the community-wide reflection. Everybody needs to be involved in times like these, reflecting on what we can learn from it. So why don't we put that in practice right now? Reflect on what we've learned so far. We've learned that we're not invincible. We've learned that a false sense of security has uh, been present in most of us, but it's now been torn away. We've learned that we have not mitigated every risk to our health and to our economy, and now we are struggling with the aftermath of that. 
I'm sure many of us have learned that we're far more fearful than we ever knew. In the days ahead, we'll have plenty of time to learn more lessons, so let me give you one more practical application here. Keep a journal. Save the newspaper. Or in some other way, preserve the memory so that you can tell it to your children and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. By doing so, you will likely help future generations better understand both the cost of discipleship and the failure of the health and wealth heresy, and ultimately relate all of this to the providential purposes of God, that his glory might be increased. So we reflect. We remember that God has, has speaks in times like these. We reflect on the lessons learned throughout these times. And then finally, we refuse to minimize times like these. Look at verse 4, our final verse here in our brief uh, look at these opening verses. And I'll lay out just a couple observations, and then we'll uh, apply everything here. First of all, you may have noticed that there are four different types of locusts that are uh, described in, the ver in this verse. And this could be taken uh, two ways. Either this is uh, four stages in the life cycle of the locust, or it is merely uh, four synonyms to complement the literary structure that we'll talk about in just a second of this verse. Either way, whichever one you take, and there are uh, debates between commentators about which is more appropriate to uh, a more appropriate way to understand this. The repetition is meant to evoke the idea of relentless pressure. It's like the pounding of the waves that just keep on coming, just pounding on a seawall. And so second, let me, let me say this. There are only two other words in this verse besides these uh, four words for locust. You can fairly well see it in uh, the English translation here that, that all you really have are words for locusts and then two other wor uh, words that are translated what's left and has eaten. You see, this, this verse itself is highly structured and it's very well patterned. In such a way that really reinforces the crippling devastation that is described in this verse. You see, the four words of, of, of the locust for the locust are meant to reflect the different stages of locust lifestyle, or life cycle rather, then this verse is representing about three months of devastation as the successive lifestyle life cycles uh, of the locust uh, come in waves and eat everything over the course of those three months. But even if it's just a literary device giving variety uh, to describe things, the repetition is suggesting that the whole economic uh, system is undone by this wave after wave of voracious destroyers who leave nothing useful behind, just stripped bare trees and stalks. This verse stares us in the face. Joel refuses to minimize the woe of this play. He's not willing to, to say it's not a big deal. We're fine. Yeah, they may have eaten what we've got, but you know, we're fine. It's okay. I'm okay. Maybe you can think of some movies where, where this uh, comedic trope uh, comes up. Something clearly happens to the character where they should be really hurt, but they jump up and they're like, I'm fine. I'm good. Don't worry about me. I think it happens in Spider-Man Homecoming. It happens at least twice in Monty Python and the uh, Holy Grail. I'm not going to actually go into any of the specifics of those, uh, but think about it. It's, it's, it's totally denying, it's minimizing the gravity of what's happening. You see, things are bad in Judah. And Joel uses these literary devices to convey to us that it's really bad. There's no attempt to minimize the pain of the loss. I think this is instructive for us as well. Now we must refuse to minimize the challenges of times like these. We need to express difficulties. This quarantine is hard. It's not fun talking into the camera. Just think about how are some of the ways that we can refuse to minimize. 
Just think about it. You and your kids, if you have them, have been ripped away from your regular routine. And that hurts. It's like that really sticky waterproof band-aid that just gets ripped off real quick. It's not fun. We refuse to minimize the pain. Maybe you're nervous about your retirement account because you thought you were set, but now about half of it's suddenly vanished. Now you're not sure if you can wait for it to build back up. You don't just pretend like everything's fine. Maybe you're tired of isolation and you desperately want to invite someone over for dinner so that you can finally have fellowship face to face rather than screen to screen. We don't minimize the challenges times like these. We express the difficulties. And, and this is why, because if you minimize the challenges and the dangers and the, and the pain and the loss, you are unloving, really. This is the, the example of, of it, by the way, it wasn't millennials who were going down uh, on spring break. It was Gen Z, so stop blaming the millennials here. Uh, we're all in our mid-30s or late 20s. Um, but that's, the, that's the, 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 the perfect case in point. Saying, oh, well, I'm going to be fine, so I'm just going to continue doing what I want. That's, that's minimizing in a loving way. It's not loving your neighbor who might actually be at risk of contracting the disease and having uh, significant um, complications. So we refuse to minimize because it's unloving, but we also refuse to minimize because it's unhealthy for our own selves. It's unhealthy for us because if we minimize, we may as well just cover over or give excuses for our sins. Yeah, I yelled at my kids because it, they were really frustrating, but it's okay. It's okay. It's not a big deal because you know what? We're all, we're all quarantined and it's really hard. That's unhealthy. You refuse to minimize. It's unhealthy to suppress your fears because all you're doing is denying what God says when he says fear not and then gives you an outlet not to fear. You don't you don't minimize. You admit, and then you move on. And so we express what's going on. We, we take heart to less, the lessons that we learn through this time, that we might grow and be sanctified in it. That will be a balm for weary souls and a shot of encouragement to your heart. Ultimately, because it is God who is speaking in times like these and giving us the source of that comfort. Let me end this uh, by just laying out how Joel is going to uh, give us that, that balm. So this is just the introductory part here. Uh, he's going to go and give us hope. And so let me just rehearse that so that we don't end on, on any, any negative notes here, that we can see that there is hope. You see, Joel, he tells us that bad things have happened or go and are going to happen. But he also tells us that God listens to the prayers of his people in their time of need. God offers relief in times of trouble. You see, times like these are not wasted, for they are preparing us for and warning us against a final day, a final time, the coming day of the Lord. And on that day, God will judge all people fully and finally. Those who are alienated from God, this book, and these times like these are a warning to seek shelter from the coming storm. But for those who are cleansed by the blood of Jesus, there is no danger, because you are safe, and you are secure in Christ Jesus. No threat, large or small, will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. This is the ultimate message of our book. Though you may have temporal troubles, and we don't minimize those, fear not, for God will preserve you to the end. I spent some time through the coming weeks unfolding this idea as we go. But what do we do now? Remember that God speaks. We reflect on what we have learned and are learning. We refuse to minimize. We might look to God for our hope.